Good morning. Today is a great day because uh, in a little while we will see our kids uh, being part of our worship gathering this morning. So um, let's uh, be excited, Lord. Uh, many of our kids are going to be singing words of worship to the Lord and um, thanksgiving at the day. So it's just a joy when the old family really gets involved in worshiping God together. From the parents, to the grandparents, to the children, well, and our, our youth, relatives and friends. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, can you open them to Deuteronomy chapter 6? And yeah. the word for the Lord for us today this morning will be regarding family discipleship. This is the continuation of what we started last time we had a prayer and fast over the prayer fast, and it would now be the area of spending time with God. So, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. I've divided it into three or four sections right now, and we start with the importance of why we need to spend time, not just together as a family, but family discipleship time. And then secondly, what would be the, re the most common reason why we can't, can't do this, why we don't do this? And third would be some suggestions, and then fourth would be some motivation on why this is so important and why this would be so wonderful for us to do. So, number one, uh, the importance of spending family time and discipleship together. We look at Deuteronomy, our word for this morning, and says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, and He is the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, we would think no, that this is the only time Moses said this to Israel. Because Israel, Moses was a busy man. He was leading over a million people. And theirs was not a safe place to be, right? They were in the wilderness. There were enemies abounding. And if someone had a reason, busy siya, it would be Moses. So it would make a lot of sense that in this declaration of his, to love God with all your soul, strength, and mind, this would be the only time. And if you could think about it, this would be the central thought to Deuteronomy. This is center, right? This, to love God with all your soul, heart, soul, and strength. Because Jesus also quotes this when he was asked years and years and years later, Jesus, what is the greatest command? And Jesus points back to this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Right? And now, the thing is, for us to understand this weight and why this is so important is that this is not the only time the busy Moses, right, is saying this. In fact, his, this is a repeated exhortation for Israel, the children of Israel, the special nation of God that He has chosen by grace. Now, He says in chapter 4, verse 1, and you can really see here, there's a repetition. And, and, and in repetition in the Bible, there is added weight, more importance. So if you're noticing something that's being said again and again in the Bible, the more it's being repeated, emphasized, the more it is weightier. And you should pay attention to that. You see, now when, when Moses now says, And now Israel, listen carefully to what? 
to the decrees and regulations. Who's giving this? The Lord. The Lord is giving them to Moses, telling Moses to give them to the people. So this is God's laws, God's decrees, God's regulations, His ways. And He's going to teach them through His prophet Moses. And the importance here is that if you listen carefully to these decrees and regulations, in chapter 4, he says it like this, Obey them so that you may live. What would be the contrary thought to that? If you don't obey these decrees and regulations, you will die. And suddenly, there is life here at stake, not just anybody's life, my life, my family's life, and even their children's, my family's ch children's life. This is the whole nation of Israel now, whether we live or die, by the decrees and regulations, if we don't pay careful attention to listen to them and obey them, we will die. That's importance enough that here, Moses takes the time to assemble the people of God to teach them. This is not a short matter. This is not the only matter. He does this, taking the time of a million people who's on their way to the promised land, and here's dangers left and right, and yet they're taking the time still, despite the busyness and the dangers of life, to be taught and to listen and to learn how to obey. That's, and then, you know, notice again, Deuteronomy 5, verse 1, Moses called all the people of Israel together and said, again, listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations that I am giving you today. And here's the thing. He's now saying, so that you will now gonna, you're going to learn them and you will now learn to obey them. So really, this time that they're being intentional about is all about teaching. Someone's teaching. What, are, what is the someone teaching? The decrees and the laws of God, the Word of God. And there's a family, an assembly that's being taught. And it's not just telling. It's teaching them so that they will learn how to obey. Now, someone once said, there's a great difference of being told and being taught. There's a great difference of telling someone something and teaching someone something. There's, no, uh, th th that would be the picture of, I will just tell you that this is the steering wheel, this is the accelerator, the pedal, this is the brake pedal, and I'm telling you that's the clutch. And here is the shift, where the gear stick where you change gears. I'm telling you all of that. But there's a great difference when I'm going to teach you how to use it. And all of a sudden, it would now mean time that I'm going to be explaining all of that, yes, but I'm also going to show you how it works and show you the applications of where it would be because there's a difference when you're just driving a straight line, you're turning a corner, with, and you're also parking going front, uh, going forward, and you're parking moving forward. And there's also a difference when you're parking parallel, right? And there's really that intricacies that when you're just telling them, you don't tell them these things. But when you're teaching them, the dynamic changes that you have to teach them to how they can learn and apply and obey them. And that's what this importance is. If you don't, what's at stake here? You're going to die. And so, that's the, the weight of this. Learn this. Obey this. Listen carefully, Israel. Our lives here are at stake. And in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, these are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. And you, I want to emphasize you. If you have Bibles, you underline you. And there's then the, the uh, what this concentric circle here, from yourself to a growing circle that's going to be your children, 
and then a bigger circle that's going to be including their children, your grandchildren. But it starts with you. So Moses is teaching the you here so that they can now teach their children and their grandchildren that they must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. And if you obey His commandments, there's great blessings. And if you don't, there's also great consequences. That's his, the, the series there from 4, 5, and 6 chapter. If you were going to sum it up, and here's the four reasons why Moses gives this top priority. Enough to take and really carve a time that despite him so busy, despite him being, you no, know, there's lots of things that he could do as well, he really gives this top priority even with his time to teach a people the decrees of God and how to obey them. And you can now just simply change this for your family, no? So me, I can say, here's four reasons why the Chong family has to give this top priority. Okay? And you can, you can change that in your family name. Okay? Here are the same, because they are the same. That obedience means me and my family will live. It now means I, it is so important that I teach, I for myself will learn to love God with everything I have and my spouse and then my children. Because if I don't, I'll die. And if I don't teach my children, it doesn't matter the quality of life I have for them in this world. How long will I live? I don't know. 70 years, 80 years, by God's grace. But even if we are, we, we get into the Philippine star and we can be the, you know, the top family of, of the Philippines, David Chong and family, yeah, 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 right. It's all nothing, right? If they don't love God. That means if I know my God and I know His Word, they won't have eternal life. They will die. They will face the wrath of God and the judgment of God forever. So, in other words, the only hope that I and my family have to live together with our Savior and see each other in heaven is if we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And we can do that because by His grace, He has so loved that He has sent His one and only Son that whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ shall live and not die. The grace has already been given. The way has already been set. Will you, father, mother, believe it? Will you give it top priority in your life? A number one indicator that you are or not is you are giving it time or you're not giving it time. Obedience means you either you live or you die because that is still faith. You don't. The one that you don't trust, that can give you pleasure or meaning in life, you don't obey. But the one you do will be your master. Whoever it is and whatever it is that you think will give you life, meaning, and purpose. Obey God. Love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that means obedience. Teaching, learning for myself, and teaching it to my family. Obey God. Right? Because why? Number two, Moses is not just teaching them, obey God and live. No, he continues, right? He's saying to them in another angle, you know what? Why is obeying God so good? Because it will protect you from God's displeasure, from the consequences that is sin. Sin will try to fool you to think that's the best way to live life, but no, right? And so obedience protects you from what? Right? If you put it this way, Dylan, why would why do you just why would you uh, why would I teach you to just have one wife? And when why am I teaching you that the only time that you should start considering, uh, you know, looking for a, a wife would be 
after you have fulfilled your responsibilities by finishing school and then, you know, becoming a man of the Lord, and then you look, right? Open, the, open yourself to that um, season of your life already. Why? Because Dylan, if he trusts that, if my children will trust that this is God's way and to trust it and obey it, I will be protected from the consequences of those people who think that sex outside marriage is just okay. That I can just choose a partner and partner and have it seemingly have no consequences afterwards. And it does. It does. It's a horrible thing. And you see, there's so many things you can apply as well. It's really just a continuing teaching and showing them that if you live, if you obey and trust God, you live. And not just live, so survive, you would see a blessed life that you would really be able to live the life in full, even in this earth. Third, Israel would be respected as a wise people. Moses is teaching Israel, you know what? By the way that you love God and the way you would obey Him, how you're doing it and what you're doing, people will, other people will take notice. Your neighbors will say, hey, this nation is different from the rest, right? And they will see a wisdom not of the world but from the Lord. There's really that difference that the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world is not compatible, you know? So it would be foolish to teach our children to become wise in the ways of the world instead of being wise in the Word of the Lord. So this is Moses telling them, people will try to sell you that this is the way, this is the wisdom. They'll, they'll try to make you worship their idols. No. And the way you do that, you will win the, the respect and, and people will take notice that you're different. You're separate. And they will take notice and Lord willing, be, give glory to the Lord as well. Fourthly, Moses gives his top priority because there's nothing else better. There's no other human laws that are better than the law of God. The best laws that we have as human beings and co can come up with is coming from the law of God. And the law that we think that we should have and the way we should run things are the ones that would now lead to chaos, anarchy, and depravity more sin and more sin. So, family. Family is what Moses is looking at. Individual families moving together, gathering together. This is an assembly, by the way. In their times, their, 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 assembly, their gathering was also called an assembly. We call our assembly right now, in the New Testament times, the church, ecclesia. Right? But there was also an assembly in the wilderness during Moses' time. And this, the assembly that they had and the assembly that we have today is the same. It's composed of families. Right? We're here together as one spiritual family, but also in a sense, we are different families, composed of different families. We're not, we don't have the same family surname, right? Family name. So, Moses is telling his assembly during his time that if it depends now on the family leaders that you are going to teach these commandments that, that Moses is teaching them, how to obey it, how to live it out, and the families are going to do the same to their kids and to their grandchildren and to the succeeding generations. We need, just as they needed it so desperately then, we need it so desperately today. To give time for family discipleship in Jesus Christ. 
Now, what would be the difficulty? And for the sake of time, I'll just identify one of the most common that we have, and that would be busyness. You know, I don't have to tell you, or I don't have to guess. You already know the greatest commandment, the great commandment. You know this. But I can guess pretty much the reason if for whatever it is and whatever you're saying, it will boil down to you're busy. You have other things to do. Other things are taking up your time. That's why you can't, for yourself, study His Word and obey His Word, meditate on His Word, and you can't teach it to your children or your children's children. You're busy. Now, the thing is, is that an acceptable reason to God? Will God accept the reason that you don't have time to spend on your, because of your busy schedule that you can't meditate on His Word. You can't teach your children to love God with all their heart, strength, and soul. Whatever reason that you have, my dear friend, it is not acceptable. I have an illustration. Can you tell that to your children that you're busy and not feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> not just one day, not just one week, but for one year. You have a reason, you're busy. Whatever it is, I have work to do, son. I'm earning money in order to, to buy, uh, to give you education, you know, to send you to the best school in town, to give you this wonderful house and not feed your children their rice, carbohydrates, protein, and fiber, vegetables, and multivitamins. That becomes unacceptable, right? Why? Because your children needs Whatever, no matter how busy you are, they need to be provided sustenance in order to live. Now that means, do you really believe that the Word of God is something that a person, your children, can live without? Do you really believe our Lord and Savior that said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God? Then all of a sudden, it doesn't really become a busy, busyness issue. It becomes a faith issue in us. It becomes a heart issue. Am I really loving the Lord, my God, with all of my heart, soul, and strength? Because if not, if I think I have a little God, if I think I have a God that can, I can get away with just by saying, Lord, I'm busy, I don't have time for you. I'll just enjoy your blessings. Then, true enough, you'll buy your reason and say, I'm busy, I don't have time. We have already the word from God about this. It's about two women whose name is Mary and Martha. In the book of Luke, chapter 10, it says there, the situation is that Jesus comes to their home. And of course, their culture of hospitality means I've got, we have to serve our guests. So this was a good reason, right? It's a good reason that you would have prepared uh, food for your guest, especially for Jesus. And here comes Martha getting busy. And all of a sudden, he, she starts noticing that her sister is not with her, helping her. And she looks around and she sees Mary at the feet of Jesus, listening to him as he teaches in a small group in their house. What does Mary, Martha say? The familiar story, right, for many. Martha says, Jesus, don't you care? Tell your, tell that woman, tell my sister, come help me, right? And what does Jesus say? 
He says, Martha, Martha, in Luke 10, 42 to 40, 40 to 42, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Now, Jesus is not saying that the many things were bad things. I'm saying that the, what's making you busy right now, I, don't, I, I think I can count with my one hand that it would be something evil, really, right? I plan to murder someone, so I'm busy, sorry. I plan to rob a bank, sorry. No, m many of us will say, I have to go to school. I have to go to the office. I have to wake up because it's a long commute. I have to buy uh, groceries afterwards. Otherwise, we won't have anything to eat. There's always going to be something that's going to be a good reason behind our busyness. But here's the thing. When Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things, many good, valid-sounding reasons, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Now, would it mean that all of a sudden, by magic, if Martha doesn't cook, food will arrive? No. What it would mean if Martha herself sits besides Mary and listens to Jesus for maybe an hour or two would mean they will eat later, an hour or two later. And that would mean for many of us, actually, Sometimes we get overwhelmed with the busyness of life, the good things, that we can forget that despite our schedule, there should be time for the important things. And many times the important things is not God, but these other things. Luke 8, 14, Jesus has already warned, given a warning. See, that's Luke 10, the story about Mary and Martha, right? Now, two chapters before that, Luke 8, 14, is the parable of the sower. And there are four soils there. And this is talking about the particular soil where the person gets choked with the busyness of life. Luke 8, 14 says, As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. So what, what fell among the thorns? The seed. What was the seed again? The Word of God. So even today, the Word of God will be, if we're going to follow the parable, is like a seed. Okay? Imagine me with a handful of seed and I'm spreading it around. And it's the Word of God. So if the Word of God is preached, is taught, it's like a seed being spread around. And the soil is the heart of the person. So you guys right now sitting there, you're soil, right? And the, what kind of soil are you? Well, Jesus warns of a particular heart, a particular person's heart that says, As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. So they've heard. They're, they're there. They hear it. But then as they go on their way, just imagine after this service, you go on your way. They are choked. And what are they choked by? The cares, the riches, pleasures of life, and their what is the consequence now? Their fruit does not mature. What's choking them is not poison, is not sin, as we think of the word sin, murder, stealing, lying. No, none of that. It's the concerns of the world. What should I eat? Right? We have to go there, we have to do that. The busyness of these cares and the riches and the pleasures of life is what's choking the word out of that heart. And what's the consequence? They're there, they're listening, but there's no fruit. They don't mature. 
They're not a good tree. Because this parable is all about just have that one particular heart that responds and the good heart that responds when the word is given and, and I mean sowed is that it grows and bears fruit. Do you know someone that might be already, you know, not just this year, maybe a few years already, have been coming and attending our assembly, GCAF, for example. And it might be you. It might be someone you know. And why is it that even though they've heard so many things, there's really just this, in their, in their lives, a something that's hardened, that they are still immature. They ought to be teaching, but they're not. They ought to be already more Christ-like in this area, but they're not. What would be one number one indicator, one of the most common reason why they have not really, it does not, it does not permeate or seep into and grow, uh, grow roots because busy. They have not meditated on the Word. They have not wrestled and to a point that I'm going to obey this, Lord. I'm going to surrender my personality. I'm going to surrender my temperament. I'm going to surrender this thing. I'm going to grow and be more like Christ. I'm going to respond like Christ. What is that? Busyness. Parents, if right now you're so busy trying to provide food and comfortable clothes and things for your children, I urge you, prioritize. Because Moses has given us this priority. This is important. This is the way that we have been given to share and, and disciple in the most basic of society, families. Our children were meant to hear the gospel from daddy and from mommy. You realize that? Our children were meant to see how the love of God is, this, is lived out, obeyed, and, and lived by example, to be followed by daddy and mommy. How does Satan attack that? Make daddy and mommy so busy, he doesn't have the time. I'm sorry, son, I don't have the time. I'll just drop you off somewhere. Cares of life, my dear friends. So if it means daddy, mommy, waking up 30 minutes earlier than what you're waking up right now, and you're saying, oh, I, don't, I can't believe that. I'm already waking up 5 o'clock. You mean to say I'm going to wake up at 4.30? What will I be with after the day is done? It's fine, right? Because what do we usually do at the evening time? Usually we do it after work. What do we do? Either we watch TV, either we go to the groceries, to buy, I know, but then, right, you can power through those times. Even though you're tired, I got to buy rice, I got to buy bread. Okay, I can be half asleep just, you know, holding the, the shopping cart and waiting for the grocery counter. We can do that. But the time with God and His Word, so important, starts with you, starts with us. Then we teach. Now, Here's some suggestions how to have some discipleship time, despite us being so busy. Moses did it. How about today? You get the clue from verse 7, 8, and 9. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them to your children, right? And really, this thing is done in how we organically and naturally learn. We learn, my dear friends, by repetition. We never learn something just by being told once. We're told again and again. And I can see it really in the life of my children, and I can look back, yeah, I also did that, right? Every day, it's like, guys, it's good to share, right? And another, I can remember another, the following later in the morning or in the afternoon, guys, you must share, right? It, it's, it's, it's really repetition, repetition, and in, in whatever ways and forms that it comes back, there's that emphasis and re-emphasis and when 
Now, if you notice and, and look at your Bibles, there's four whens, right? When you're at home, you do this, keep on doing this, repeat them again and again, talk about them. When you're at home, when you're at the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. What's that? That looks like everyday routines to me. That looks like everyday, ordinary life. That I, as I'm supposed to be at home, they come home from school, I come home from work. This is the thing that we do. Even if it means just a few minutes, one minute, two minutes, three minute conversation, like, hey, Dylan, how's your work? Or, hey, babe, how's your work? And then, and G will sometimes tell me when I come home, oh, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. And, and suddenly it becomes a time with the Lord and His Word, right? This is what God says about that, right? We have this promise. And then we, we, we want to pray about that. We want to wrestle with that uh, thing, right? When, when my children come home and they, they say, oh, I had this, I did, I did this, and there's that again, right? Repeat them, talk about them, right? Okay, son, what did we talk about that, right? Before you went to school, we already told you about that. So now you're expounding it. Okay, so what happened? Okay, this is what did. This is what God said. Now, how do we reconcile that with what you did and how are you going to start or live out obedient, obeying the Lord. When you're on the road, right, from you're on your way to school, you could simply have them say a verse or memory verse. There's so many things, right? This is all built in life, in a routinary life. You might be thinking that you don't have the time, you're busy, because you're thinking this is going to be so separate from what you're doing, so alien, as if it has no connect, no connection with how we live life. No, my dear friends, you are already doing it if you're a parent. You're already teaching your children. You're teaching them how to eat. You're teaching them how to go to school. You're teaching them responsibility. Wash your plate. Clean up the bathroom. Uh, pick up the trash on the floor. But what we're doing here with family discipleship time is that you're teaching them about God, connecting everyday life in the home, on the road, going to bed, and getting up, how it is to love God with everything that we have, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. So, going to bed, for us, it might look different to you, but for us, we, it looked like this. When they were small, uh, we called our going to bed time as love love time, right? And it would be, it would vary from watching a movie or uh, reading bedtime Bible stories or telling them about, about God and, and, uh, or playing around with them because that's what I also learned from my dad uh, that he would wrestle with us. So I, we'd also do that, right? It's, it's making them feel the love of God. And I want, I'd say them more than, more than once. I'd say, Dylan, do you know why daddy loves you? Oh, wait. With Dylan, do you know why daddy, do you feel that daddy loves you? And he said, yeah. Uh, do you know why daddy loves you? He said, why? And I say, because daddy loves Jesus. It, it could be as simple as that, right? And it's, it's something that your children goes up. Now, they're small children, but I've also been a youth pastor. And when it comes to, uh, you know, college students and, and young professionals, you can't wrestle with them already in the bed. It looks awkward now, right? So some, this is going to be different, the dynamics. You're going to be listening. They're going to be talking about their lives. And on my part, as, as their spiritual elder, would be to give them the Word of God. And I tell them again and again, the best thing I can do for you is to point you to Jesus. And this is what it looks like, right? You're, you're, that problem that you're sharing to me, that, that, that burden, this is what God said, and this is what and how it can be lived and trusted upon. So it doesn't change the essence of teaching them, repeating it and again, talking about it. What, what are we talking about? Loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength. So that's number one, right? Practical tip for us. Build it in, in the ordinary routines of your life. From bedtime to wake-up time to travel time to chores time to uh, even when you're at home and relaxing. 
if it, it means from five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minute talk, if you do it every day or a regular basis, then there's going to be progress for sure. And the second tip for us is tie them to your hands, wear them on your forehead, write them on your door, doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now think about it. Every day, some, the work that you do would mean working with your hands. That means as you go and work, what's going to happen? Put reminders, visible or otherwise, that as you work, you're going to be reminded, read your Bible, love your wife, tell your wife you love her, tell your children you love them, right? Put memory verses, verses that you want. If I'm struggling with anxiety, I want a word from God, right? If I'm struggling with my anger, I want a word from God. What, what do I do, Lord? What, what am I doing with this emotion? It's threatening to overwhelm me and be, making me become bitter. It's, it's tempting me to withhold forgiveness. What do I do? And what, do we, what does a person that relies and wants the Word of God? Put reminders. Put reminder about a word, right? About God's Word, about what you're going through right now, struggling. Put it in your da da uh, I mean dashboard or uh, cell phone, uh, whatever we do, right? You can write them on your doorpost of your house. That means even in your place of residency, you can put, my dad has put a, and mom has put a, uh, a, a, a sign there that says, as for me and my house, we will worship, we will uh, love the Lord, right? serve the Lord, right? And that's our family verse. And I grew up on that family verse of my dad and mom, and that has been also a great influence in my life. So you can do that as well for you and your children. Teach them, right? Some other practical tips I learned from my parents was they would, when we were small, they, we would have in a dining table, they would have a whiteboard. And every day during mealtimes, they would erase a word of a, of a, a ver verse. So from John 3.16, for example, they would erase for God. And then we would now re remember or memorize it, right? And then until everything's erased, and then we would be able to memorize it and by memory. So we're heading there as a family because uh, I have a five-year-old pa and an eight, a nine-year-old. So, no, it can change in the season and in the way you can think. I'm for sure of many things, but be intentional and give it time. Now, uh, the second tip I want is to make sure you understand that these are not just free-for-all conversation. This is a guided conversation. What are you helping talk about during your family discipleship? About how we can love the Lord, about His decrees, about His Word, and how we can love it. These are guided conversations, in other words. Right? Even if you're listening to them in their day, you guide their thought, their heart, their emotions, and what they're doing with the Word of God. I learned from somebody as well, right? And, and I'm planning to apply it to that. Um, we have a Lola that uh, every time she receives the Word, she would teach her grandchildren about the Word, right? She would take materials from uh, the Sunday school and then she would teach it to her children, uh, her grandchildren. Um, I, I also know someone that uh, during pandemic time, they would have this uh, family time after, family discipleship time after the sermon as well, after Sunday service as well. So you can do that as well if you, if you think that you can have that in your families. But for sure, do this, right? Have guided conversation. Your, this is the meat, the word that we're eating, right? So listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is our, the Lord is our God, in He am alone. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. That is basically this, right? A committing wholeheartedly, whole person, and that's what you're shaping your children, your family to be. If you think about it, heart, soul, strength, these are your emotions, thoughts, and actions. So that's what you're doing. 
you're guiding their emotion, thoughts, and actions by teaching them what God says about this and how we should live this out. If I'm struggling with an emotion, if I'm struggling in, in my thoughts, if I'm struggling with an action, we correct with the Word of God. And then we help the person, your children, or your family. No? Because many of times they will say, I don't want to do it. I have this reason, I have that reason. Right? And your conversation will be about, okay, you ha you, this is, you're trusting in this because you think that if you do this thing, this will what will give you vindication, meaning, and you know, what will make you feel good. But trust me, son, right? Trust me, daughter. This is what God said. And look, daddy also has done this. See, when daddy did this, this, is, this is was it, right? So if you're doing that, we are going to reap so many wonderful, wonderful things. Your family will learn what it is, what it looks like, to love and trust the Lord. And they will, for themselves, see and experience the blessings of the Lord. What it really means to live in a life free from the consequences of sinful action, willful rebellion. And that would be our hope. That they will love Jesus with all their heart, soul, and strength. Parents, we should create intentional time, and we do this by building in to our routinary life for our family, making sure that our every day, this is it. This is what's important for us. This is what is important for daddy and mommy. Son, you're going to hear from daddy the word, okay? We're going we're gonna to be talking about God. You're going to see me love God. So that they would now, you would guys would now talk about it. They will now think about it. And they will now learn to live in it. Now I want to close with this. The motivation for us. Because it starts with each and every one of us. You could be a single person right now. You don't have kids yet. But I tell you, single, and I, I wasn't able to tell this last time in our prayer and fasting. But even a single man and a single woman can be a spiritual father or mother. Paul was never married. He had sons. Jesus never married, but he had children. Spiritual children, I mean. Now, what would be the blessing of you, each and every one of us here, whether you're a dad, a mom, or a child, if you spend time with the Lord? Not just, you know, reading it as routinary or something ordinary i'm saying reading and spending reading the word of god and spending time with the lord that he does his work in your heart i'll tell you one and then we'll see a video this would be make, like the video would make closing i'm up in the mountains and i'm wrestling with my heart i'm all spent okay i'm in anguish i'm heartbroken and then I come upon the psalm, right? And all of a sudden, I'm, right? It, it grabs my heart. And I'm, it is early in the morning. I'm in the mountains. And I'm, I'm like a crazy dude, right? I'm jumping up and down with joy. Another thing, separate thing happened. Like this was uh, early this year, I think. Uh, yeah, earlier this year. Same thing. I'm anguishing. I'm, I'm wrestling. I'm praying to the Lord, right? And it's gripping my heart. There's a, such a heavy burden. And... Here, the Lord, then the Lord leads me to Jeremiah 15, 16. It says, When I discovered your words, I devoured them, and they are my joy and my heart's delight. For I hear your name, O Lord, God of heaven's armies. You might hear it today, and nothing. I read that 1 o'clock in the morning after trying four hours of trying to sleep, but I couldn't. And I read that, and you know what happened? Something exploded here. Poof. And tears come and you're set free. 
Promise didn't go away, but the word of God has spoken. I'm eating it, and then joy comes in my heart's delight. You know what? I woke, I wake up my wife, I woke up my wife after an hour of that, and we had a wonderful time talking about the Lord and His plans for our lives. I'm going to show you a video that this is not just me. That's just Him. You, each and every one of you, as an overflow of spending time with the Lord and Him doing His supernatural work, this is worth your time. Let's watch this. You just got up early before anybody else is moving around, except you can hear your wife stirring. Teenager's probably not up, but school is coming, so he might be dragging himself out. And you're reading your Bible in your favorite...